34 degrees at 16 minutes past the 8 o'clock hour on a Friday, April the 14th. Chris Lenoir, your host of the Green Mountain Mornings, continuing now up until 9 o'clock. And the website for your reader-supported independent news and views source for Wyndham County is commonsnews.org. The Commons is free on stands every Wednesday and every Friday. We're joined by its deputy editor, Randy Holhut. Good morning to you, Randy. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. And of course, uh, for this first segment, uh, Joyce's ears are definitely going to be burning as two of her biggest fans talk about her and her story (laughs) in the voices section of this week's edition of the Commons, uh, getting an interview with Bill McKibben, uh, the environmentalist, Middlebury College professor, founder of 350.org. Now, this is a, a very lengthy story randy in the voices section of the commons but it's just an excerpt of a bigger story she did for vermont business magazine yes and that's how we got the interviewer so to say joyce got the interview i tagged along as her photographer and driver up to middlebury we we went up there in january uh not long after uh president trump signed the bill authorizing uh the keystone xl pipeline and uh the Pipeline through the Standing Rock Reservation out in the out in the Dakotas, so you'd figure this guy is going to be really wicked, depressed uh-huh. and down yeah. for having his life work blown up. He's and seen- uh, we found somebody who is kind and generous and uh, still possessing his his, his humor and, and good nature, and committed more than ever to to fighting for for the survival of the planet. Yeah, he seemed a, a little down, obviously, from that, but not despondent like it was a, a setback that, that couldn't be overcome. Uh, and certainly the way you lay out his journey uh, to becoming somebody who uh, is really at the, the forefront, the figurehead of this whole movement of, of climate change and, and combating climate change and raising awareness about it, uh, it shows that he's always been somebody who has quite a bit of resolve and quite a bit of inner determination. I found it fascinating, and I can't remember another time uh, somebody has done this kind of profile of McKibben or the 350 movement. This has got to be a first. That's what we kind of gathered from yeah. from in in researching the story. Joyce discovered that there really wasn't quite. There's a lot of stuff about McKibben's work and McKibben's thoughts on on the environment and uh, and climate change, but there's not that much biographical yeah. information out there about about McKibben and how and how he started and. Uh, and that's definitely the stuff that you can find in the Vermont Business Magazine uh, version of this story, which is at least twice as long as what you see wow. in the Commons this week. Uh, fascinating individual, and in you know he certainly made the most of the opportunities he got growing up. Uh, you know, being the, the child of a of, of business journalist and uh, taking advantage of the, the Harvard connections to, yeah. to get to the, the job every writer wants to be at the New Yorker. Right out of college, he got to write for the New Yorker. I mean, that was that was incredible, and and, uh, and a great little anecdote there of of Mister Sean calling him up and him thinking it was a prank. <laughs> and then, well, you'd, you'd think that because you oh. you you don't expect to to do that <laughs> to have the the publisher of the New Yorker. I mean, the editor of the New Yorker give you a call and say, you know, hey kid, you want to write for us? Yeah. But they apparently back then were you know scouting the the college papers of the Ivies and uh, looking for new talent. Yeah, and good good on him uh, for, for answering that call and, and certainly making the most of it and then evolving into this uh, writer about the environment and then uh, making the change uh, to becoming somebody who's more of an activist, realizing that needed to be the change. I wonder, you know, obviously, as you said, people know 350.org, people know him from his writing. Uh, how did he become, uh, getting to meet him in person, how did he become that right person at the right time to be the figurehead? What What is it about him, you think, that makes him this this movement leader? Well, I wouldn't call, quite call him the figurehead, because that yeah. would impl- imply that you know, he's, he's the person in charge of that. I think it's mainly the, the role he's carved out for himself as the first popular, 
popularizer of, of the theories of, of climate change and global warming. You know, a lot of scientists have written about it over the years, but he's the person who's kind of taken the, taken the data and the information and put it into a form that is accessible to, to the average reader. And uh, also recognizing that uh, you can have the facts on your side, but you need more than facts when you're in, in a battle against very entrenched, very powerful interests that have no interest in, in, uh, in your facts. Yeah, and I love the other aspect of this, uh, coming to Middlebury College uh, to be a professor and leveraging the uh, tools of that institution in order to get the the word out to so many different parts of the globe, right? Uh, Using their language program there to have the information translated on the spot. That's a nice little asset. (laughs) Yeah, and unexpected because you really don't think of of Middlebury like that. Right. Um, You think of it just like kind of a junior Ivy. Right, (laughs) right. Kind of school, but you don't think of it. You don't off the top of your head that uh, language is one of its uh, one of its strengths, right? But uh, also just the fact that uh, he's learned to really love being uh, being in the woods mm. and being in Vermont, and he's also recognized the power of community. And uh, we've known all along, of course, you being growing up here, me adopting this state as my home, that this is a great place for community. And uh, when the world gets really, really crazy, this is going to be a very important place to be. Yeah, yeah, and I think he's uh, definitely brought that sensibility to everything he communicates beyond the borders of Vermont. And the timing of this being published uh, by the Commons, as well as uh, in Vermont Business Magazine, really important in April 22nd, Earth Day, the Scientist March, uh, the Climate March uh, on April 29th. We actually were speaking to Rob Kidd of the Sierra Club about the uh, Montpelier aspect of that yesterday. Uh, It's becoming more and more important to capture the media attention, and that seems to me to be the missing component when you're talking about the mass media and television media with regards to climate change. And I think part of it is because you don't have that big visual, right? I mean, climate change is such a slow-moving process. It's been hard for uh, the the visual media to grasp onto. I wonder if, if McKibben talked about that aspect of of it. He certainly talked about fighting against the money interests of the fossil fuel industry, but did he talk about at all? Uh, and maybe that's in the Vermont business part about well, how the television media really isn't uh, addressing this issue with the seriousness that it should? No, but uh, yeah. you kind of expect television to, to trivialize and, and sensationalize any issue, but yeah. there are visuals. I mean, yeah. the, our, the Arctic towns in the Arctic, they're disappearing because of permafrost just sucking the sucking the the villages down the the the, the islands in the Pacific there uh, is being submerged by rising sea levels the salt water is bubbling up on Palm Beach <laughs> the the uh, out of control forest fires the uh, you know you name name it and there's plenty of visuals to go with this story it's just whether you just want to say oh it's we got a blizzard so there's no global warming right <laughs> right I guess it does no. come down to that information war and and some of the ways yeah. that uh, that the fossil fuel industry has knowingly uh, and that uh, case still being litigated, but has knowingly, just like the tobacco industry, tried to deny <laughs> and obfuscate some of the facts that are out there. It's a fascinating read on, on the Voices section of this week's edition of The Commons. Uh, even bigger story available on the Vermont Business Magazine site. Congratulations, Joyce, on that great interview. Congratulations to you, Randy, on the great photos and being part of it. We'll talk to you more about other stories in this week's edition of The Commons when we get back after the bottom of the hour news break. Stick around. Up to 37 degrees now at 20 minutes before the 9 o'clock hour. Beautiful sunshine outside our William Street studio and hopefully wherever you are as well. I know the sun is shining. It's always shining over the compound in Dummerston that we speak to Randy Holhut from each and every Friday morning. Right, Randy? You got the sun shining out there? The sun's shining bright. The birds are singing boldly. Nice, nice. And of course, uh, the Commons uh, has its spring issue, so people can look and talk about those signs of spring uh, that... Uh, People hold deer here, and including including those last little patches of snow, right? I mean, there's like my neighbor, one one part of her yard where the sun doesn't quite hit it all the time. There's just one little patch of snow left in our neighborhood. I don't know if you got that outside your place. Well, there's a little bit of snow there, but I'm thinking like down at the at, at Tenney Field. <laughs> there's right. still two big snow banks in the, in the, behind the left field fence. Right, <laughs> yes, and we'll, we'll take up some of the, the spring sports challenges a little bit later on in this segment. But I want to start with uh, Mike Fair's coverage of this opiate forum up in Bellows Falls. Now, 
you all just had your Voices Live Forum dedicated to some of these issues uh, here in the Brattleboro area. I wonder, comparing to some of the things that you heard at the, uh, the I think that was at the library, that yeah, Voices like Live library. Forum, uh, versus what Mike was covering up in Bellows Falls uh, with, with Skip Gates coming down and telling that powerful story about his son at uh, University of Vermont dying of a heroin overdose, and there's a short film about that that they screened in addition to that forum. Uh, similarities uh, or, or differences, really, between a, a community like Bells Falls and Brattleboro. Are we are we having different experiences with this opiate crisis? Well, the experience seems to be about the same same here as in in, in, in Bells Falls. But the main thing is that this, this one seemed to be skewing a little bit younger with the, having uh, someone who is fresh out of rehab and and uh, still experience willing to talk about her experience as being a, a, a young drug addict and, and recovering from it. Yeah, you're talking about Brandy uh, Cheney. Brandy Cheney. Yeah, I mean, really, and, and, the, and the approach uh, that she's taking, and, and it reminds me of when we did our forum, uh, we did our, our call to action forum, and somebody there talking about the first time he tried uh, opiates, and he said, and I really liked it. I, I think that is an important message, and one that we always try to, to steer kids away from but there's a reason that people go to drugs and and we have to be honest about that i think brandy's absolutely right if you think that the human beings have been getting high since caveman days on one substance or another and that you know that, that the brain is kind of predisposed to looking for for those sorts of things and you just it's you use the stuff and you have no idea where where it goes and where your where your head's going to go and how you're going to react to it and uh, you know one size doesn't fit all and just saying no is worse than useless when it comes to dealing with with uh, with drug addiction and drug uh, drug abuse prevention yeah and and captain uh, john merrigan uh, the vermont state police who has been part of our forums and i have to just give a little shout out to john because he was a classmate of mine uh, talking about uh, heroin now, I mean, it began as a prescription drug problem, and I know that's been well documented in the Commons uh, with Bess O'Brien's film coming down here. But it really is a, a heroin problem and a cheap heroin problem now, or or all these other offshoots of heroin like fentanyl, right? Well, it's more of a case of you know how the how the, the big pharmaceutical companies push the the their synthetic opioids on people. And you know the story, the story that won a Pulitzer Prize this week about oh, yeah. uh, the little towns in, in West Virginia getting seven hundred million pills. <laughs> Unbelievable. And and that's it. You know, if doctors writing scripts for 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 this stuff, you get hooked on it. You can't afford to buy it, but you know, go down and get a a, a bag of heroin for less than the the oxy that you just got at the at the pharmacy. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty downhill ride from the oxy to the heroin and uh, into addiction yeah and if it's uh, as john as captain merrigan said six dollars a bag in bell's falls and yeah, easier to, and easier to get the six pack right you what what is going to be your choice are you going to try and and score some beer as an adolescent or are you going to try and score some heroin uh, it's it's not a fair fight in that situation and, and a big uphill climb uh for communities like bell's falls and brattleboro but great to see these different approaches and and hopefully we'll see uh, some results among the youth. Uh, just getting back to uh, the the Voices Live forum that the Commons did. I know a lot of times you end up transcribing a, a fair amount of that. Is it is that still in the offing? It should be, but yeah. I have no idea when it will be okay. appearing. So Takes a while. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's a lot of work to, work to a, get down and on, on, onto the screen. Yeah, a lot, a lot of work. And in the meantime, I know it was documented by Brattleboro Community Television. So people, if they weren't able to get there to the library that night, they can go to uh, the Brattleboro TV dot org website and watch the video of that. I uh, want to shift to uh, the Brattleboro Select Board meeting last week. Nice to have Wendy Levy on board there uh, covering those meetings now, and I had a brief conversation about this with her uh, when she was in here on Monday, but I wanted to get your take on this plastic bag ban that is being proposed, and as uh, Brattleboro tries to figure out how to implement this, I-, I got a feeling this is going to be the next big issue here in town. Well, that's going to be the next uh, the Pay as you throw. Pay as you throw, skate park. I mean, you you name it. There's going to be this, wait a minute, we voted to do what? And this is going to impact, or the 1% local options tax. I mean, we had so many merchants come out against that 1% local options tax. Don't you see a similar kind of how this is going to burden us uh, sort of pushback? Well, what is the most familiar trademark of Brattleboro? Is it 
those red striped bags that you see coming out of a certain <laughs> Army and Navy store? Why, yes, it is, Randy. That would that has been my go-to example of this whole thing. It's like, what is... And, and that, is, <laughs> <laughs> that is why the Barofskis have been fighting this, this, this uh, ban. They've been in front of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm someone who takes the canvas bags with with them when they when I go cr- grocery shopping and you know try to, to to not take bags if I don't need to, but there are times when you need to. Yeah, yeah, same here. We we try to bring those those bags with us when we can, but it's not. Sometimes you forget. Sometimes you don't have enough of them. Uh, there, there's a number of different reasons why. And, and then sometimes it's just messy, and you need to throw <laughs> it a plastic bag. That's right. You got ice cream in there, and you got to run another couple errands, something like that. Um, and and then you know this, uh, all these sorts of uh, initiatives end up falling on low income people because they say, "Well, you can buy one of our canvas bags," uh, and that certainly is not going to be something that is going to always resonate with people. I, I just get the feeling this is again getting back to that. There's two different Brattleboros or two different Brattleboro communities. There's the one that's been here. Uh, generation upon generation, and then there's the the back to the land movement of the 70s and 80s, and it just kind of these two groups have never fully mingled together in a way that is going to make something like this resonate across the greater population of Brattleboro. To me, yeah, it's hard to convince somebody that they should buy a twelve dollar tote bag when they can't afford to buy the food that filled the twelve dollar tote bag. Yeah. So I, I don't know when, I guess, you know, they'll have some public hearings on this and, and you have that, the, a certain faction of people that no matter how many public hearings you warn, uh, that they're going to come out until after they start seeing the results in the stores. But, but I, I foresee this being, a, a, an issue that is not going to go away anytime soon. No, this is not going to be solved easily, but, uh, I think in terms of just sheer common sense that, you know, if you have, if you have access to canvas bags or reusable bags, or you reuse your plastic bags, or you recycle your plastic bags with the places that take them. Do that yeah. in, in the interim. And and by the way, at least at, at Price Chopper in town, if you bring your bags, you get a two cent discount per bag, uh, which isn't a lot, but it's an incentive. I mean, and I think this is a an initiative that the carrot is a, a better idea than the stick. And to me, it's too big of a stick to make people buy these bags. Well, actually, you know, if you go to a place like Aldi's, they make you buy. If you don't have your True. bags with you, you have to buy them. Right, right. And then there, <laughs> so that's the other incentive. Right, and there, there is uh, that that element to it as well. Uh, let's switch uh, back to uh, the sports. We were referring to that earlier. As far as for you and I, that is the definite sign of spring when uh, the sports teams get outdoor. Uh, you had a great photo uh, on the sports page uh, this week of the of uh, Zoe Brooks of Leland and Gray in the gym with her nevertheless she persisted uh, tank top uh, doing batting practice but unfortunately the backdrop is bleachers rather than a batting cage outdoors <laughs> right well I, when i saw that shirt i had to get that into the paper yes yeah but you know that, that but anyways you know gym ball is just an unavoidable fact of life for for baseball and softball in vermont in this time of year because you just don't know I was at the uh, BF Brattleboro game on Monday. It was the, only the second time out for both teams outside, and it was a pretty good game. Leaf Bigelow pitched. Uh, you know, it wasn't the sharpest game, but he pitched through a shutout. Um, yeah, that's other... not bad. <laughs> he wasn't sharp, but he still pitched a shutout. I mean, they're going to have a good team again this year, the Colonels, right? Yeah, they're going to have a good team this this year. You know, whether they you know get enough hitting to support him, and it looked kind of uh, shaky at the beginning. Uh, Bellows Falls is going to have a good team too, notwithstanding losing eight to nothing in that in that game. Mm. Sounds like the opposite issue for the Brattleboro softball team, where they're going to have a lot of hitting, but I wonder if they're going to have anybody to replace uh, to replace uh, Hannah uh, Hannah Wilson as their pitcher. Yes, <laughs> you know uh, Kelly Markle was despairing was despairing last year about you know what am I going to do for a pitcher? Yeah, but and, they've got uh, offense. You know, some, somebody always emerges, but you just never can tell. And and games this time of year, you never can tell too. Like uh, I guess uh, Twin Valley had their first game up in West Rutland uh, on Monday, and they lost thirty three to whoa <laughs> to to two or something of like that. But the number that stood out was twenty four walks. Wow. Yeah, that's what happens when you don't have a pitcher. You need to have that that dominant pitcher. I mean, because yeah, that that softball team we saw Brattleboro girls softball team a bunch of times last year. Great defense, uh, great offense, young players. Uh, but yeah, if you don't have that 
that uh, person on the mound who can just get you the strikeouts. It becomes a challenging season for sure. Uh, but looking forward to getting out there. Uh, we'll be doing uh, the boys and girls lacrosse games at Brattleboro, and I'm sure we'll see you out there on the scene, Randy. Well, I was out at the uh, girls lacrosse yesterday, uh, uh, 8-7 win over Wakona. Oh, good, good, excellent. Yeah, we begin our, our broadcast season uh, a week from Saturday here when their first uh, game goes. So we'll see you out there. We'll talk to you again next Friday as well, Randy. Uh, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you. All right, Randy Olhut of the Commons, your reader-supported news and views source for Wyndham County. Free on stands every Wednesday online at commonsnews.org. Go there and become a member today and support all the great work they do covering our community. We'll be back to wrap up this edition of Green Mountain Mornings right after these messages.